Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd of the Street and today we are taking a look at two Cisco routers. Alright guys, so last week my buddy Michael Cheneau, who has helped me out with a lot of Nerd of the Street productions in the past, texted me asking if I wanted a couple of old Cisco routers. Both of us went to school for networking, learning how to configure these things basically, and this is the equipment that runs the internet, you know. Routers and switches made by big, huge companies like Cisco. And I told him, sure, I'll take a couple Cisco routers. Cisco equipment in general uh, is very, very pricey because they sell to huge companies like internet service providers and very large corporations with very expensive networks. You know, Cisco owns some other brands like Linksys for home and small office equipment, and Cisco does have some small business product lines. But a lot of their equipment, including this equipment, is many thousands of dollars when it's brand new. However, this equipment is years old. Apparently one of Michael's friends works at a company that was upgrading their network, and so they were throwing out a lot of these. And so some of them were dispersed to employees who wanted them, and from there they made their way, in this case, to me. Now Cisco routers, in case you're not aware, they run an operating system called iOS. Yes, it sounds just like the operating system on Apple devices. Cisco iOS was around long before Apple's iOS. It stands for Internetwork Operating System, and it's a command line based operating system, which is one of the things that pushed me towards Cisco in the first place at the college that I went to. All the configuration is done from a command line, and it's not as nice of a command line as Linux has, you know, it's not as good as Bash. But it does have some uh, features that make it fairly easy to use, auto completion and things like that. So here today we've got, first of all, the two routers themselves, and one of these is a Cisco 1900 series router. The other is a 2800 series, and the 2800 is actually older than the 1900. We'll look at the exact model names and numbers in a minute. But I'm going to be taking a look around these because I just got them. I haven't looked at them much aside from just dusting them off. And then I've also got here, Michael and I stopped by Monoprice because I had never had any of these in person. You know, I just, I, I actually, my job is almost exclusively dealing with this kind of equipment. Um, but I have never owned a piece of this equipment myself. So I didn't have any way to connect into here. Like I said, it's a command line operating system, but how do you access that command line? Once you get these things configured, you can SSH into them. But in order to get to that point, you need to be able to connect directly into them with a console connection, an actual analog console connection. And for that, we picked up, for one thing, a console cable here, which is going to go from the RJ45 console connector to a 9-pin console connector. And we'll take this out of the bag in a moment. And then, of course, none of my computers have a 9-pin console connector because all my computers are much newer than that. And so I also picked up a 9-pin console to USB converter. And I did do a quick Google search while we were standing in Monoprice, and this thing supposedly does work with Linux. So we'll see how that works in a couple minutes here. First, though, I'm really excited to actually see these things. You can see they are flat fairly large and I'm actually gonna bring the camera in just a little bit closer I'm gonna zoom it in so you can see them a little better alright so I know I had the 1900 on top here but we're actually gonna look at the 2800 first because it's the older one I'm personally more excited about the 1900 so we'll save the best for last this bigger one this is a full-size rack mount piece of equipment you see if I pick this up and turn it around here we've got these two things sticking off of either side of it and this is so that you can slide it into a rack and then screw it in with four screws or two screws in some cases. And you can have a rack full of just networking equipment or you can have a rack with a router and a switch and some servers. Now personally, I'm not a fan of racks. I'm not a fan of rack mounted equipment at all because I don't own any racks, you know, and I don't have a need for that many different physical devices. This kind of form factor does not make sense to me. Michael's got some rack mount servers, and I think he might actually have a rack in his bedroom that he puts equipment in, but I don't. So equipment like this, it's just very big. It, it's got a big desk footprint, you know, it takes up a lot of space, but it's annoyingly short and, you know, fairly heavy. So not a fan of the form factor, but that's pretty much how all Cisco equipment is once you get into the higher end stuff. Uh, so what you're looking at right now, Cisco equipment, especially the rack mount stuff, doesn't necessarily have a front or a back, but I would call, I guess, what you're looking at right now the back. And I actually have to stand up and look over here to see what I'm pointing at. Uh, it looks like over here we've got 
a plate that we can remove to access some of the internals of this thing. Over here we have four HWIC slots. These are basically expansion slots that you can put more features into the router with, more ports, more whatever. You can see there is a T1 port that has been inserted into one of these slots. These used to be used to add things like serial slots, serial ports to devices, but serial's not quite as popular as it used to be. Over here on the left side, we've got our two actual ethernet ports. So unlike your home router that is actually doing, you know, a few different functions, routing, switching, it's being a wireless access point. This router is just meant to be a router and it's meant to be a really good router, but it's not meant to be a switch. So it doesn't have four ports or eight ports to connect a whole bunch of different devices to. All that this thing is supposed to do is route between two different networks and you're gonna plug one of those networks in right here and the other one in right there. Now, of course, this device has a T1 slot, so maybe if you've got a T1 connection to your internet service provider, you could plug that in here and have two internal networks running off the router. But for the most part, you're not going to be plugging computers into this thing. You're going to be plugging this into a switch that's going to have a whole lot of different ports for you to plug more than one computer into. Those computers will be on the same network connected by the switch, and the router sits between that network and other networks, advertises the routes and things like that. So one of these ports is labeled FE01 and the other is FE00. FE stands for fast ethernet. Now that's not actually that fast because fast ethernet is 100 megabits per second. GE stands for gigabit ethernet and that's what the other router said. So like I said, that smaller router with a lower model number is actually a newer and nicer piece of equipment than this one. And both of them are devices that this company threw away. So of course it's not gonna be state of the art or anything, but you know, depending on where you are and what your internet speed is, you know, here in St. Louis, some places have gigabit internet available, but I've never lived in a house that got more than 100 megabits per second down. Usually we get way less than that, like 30 or 40 megabits per second down. So even though this is sort of antiquated equipment with fast ethernet ports that are limited to 100 megabits per second, that's actually going to be still fairly useful for, for projects today. You know, maybe once I've got my own house and I do have gigabit internet because you know I'm gonna have that once I do move out. I might not want to use this for my home router, but there are still plenty of places where it can be um, relevant. So yeah, this thing is in fairly good shape. You know, all the screws, uh, they still turn. None of them have been dented in or anything. There are a few scratches on the top of this thing, but that's about it. Um, over here on the right, you can see there's a little bit of writing here with a marker that says existing router. And you know, I, I can confirm this is an existing router. So I decided not to wipe that off of there. You can see here, there used to be a sticker with probably the name of this device within the company's network that's been torn off. Over here, we've got the actual Cisco model number and serial number and all that or at least model number. I don't, I don't really know what those mean. Oh, it looks like there is a serial number there. But this is a 2811 router you can see right there on the far right side it would be for you guys. So yeah, that is what this side of the device looks like. The top of it you can see, like I said, completely flat because you're supposed to stack a whole bunch of these things on top of each other. Uh, the bottom looks similar to the top except it's not painted. The bottom does have a, a sticker on it here. If we flip it around, we can take a quick look at that. Uh, caution, just stuff about the power supply, all that normal stuff you get on computer equipment. And if we put the thing back right side up, you can see the sides are also empty, save for some uh, vents for the fans, which are very loud because they're so small, they have to spin very quickly. That's another reason I don't like rack mount equipment because of how loud it is. But here we can take a look at the quote unquote front of the device. Of course, the front in this case has the power plug uh, which normally the power plug is in the back of, you know, desktop computers and whatnot, but it does have a power plug and it's got the switch on the power supply. Nice that the power supply at least has a switch because I have seen rack mount devices in the past that don't even have a switch on the power supply. If you want to turn them off, you literally just have to unplug them or cut power with, you know, an external switch. But this thing does have a power switch. Standing up again here, we'll see there is sort of this nice plastic design on here, uh, making it look sort of cool. It is a very antiquated design. You can definitely tell this thing was, you know, made a, a decade or so ago based on those colors and everything. I'm actually gonna come around the desk here to read this better. What does this say? This says, redundant power supply connection only. Hmm, I, I don't know what that means. 
Um, these devices can definitely have redundant power supplies, so you can have more than one PSU. The reason you would want that is because sometimes these things do fail, and in an enterprise environment, if one power supply fails, you don't want it to take the device down. Maybe you've got two different circuits in your building, and you've got each power supply plugged into one circuit so that a circuit tripping doesn't take the device down. But looking further down this thing, this is just a bunch of empty space where I guess the other power supply might be. Oh, peel a label here, it says, yeah. I can feel that this thing is, is empty behind here. Um, so then over here, we've got our console port, and this is where we'll actually plug in to configure the device when we first turn it on. Below it is an aux port, auxiliary port. That is for remote access. You can actually set these things up with a dial-up modem, basically, so that if your network goes down, you can call into your router to reconfigure it if you need to. Because once again, if this is sitting in a closet, um, at some other building in some other city in your huge company, you might not be able to just walk up to it with a console connector on a laptop and plug into it. You might need remote access, um, and so that's what the aux port's for. We do have two USB ports, and that's helpful for getting iOS loaded onto here. Once you're up and running, you can use SCP or FTP to get files onto these devices. But of course, once again, if you don't have connectivity, then you're just going to have to use a USB drive. Um, and then finally, way over on the left, we've got, this says, compact flash, do not remove during network operation. Uh, now this actually, this slot looks empty, which is unfortunate. I guess that means there's no flash card in this specific slot. Yeah, this is the, uh, the button, I think, to remove the flash if there is something in there. So that's empty. Um, now I'm wondering if there's internal flash. I would expect there to be an internal boot flash inside of this thing to hold you know, iOS for one thing, and also to hold your saved configuration, your startup configuration, because on a Cisco device, everything runs off a of flash. Setting this thing down again here. Man, rack mount devices are such a pain. Um, on a Cisco device, there are no hard drives. Everything is running off of flash because with networking, every millisecond counts, and we don't ever want to be waiting on a hard drive to spin. So Cisco devices were on flash years before SSDs were common. Now that flash is pretty prone to breaking, and it's also very expensive, so that's why everything wasn't using flash back when Cisco started using flash storage. The flash storage in these things is also incredibly small because of how expensive it is. But what you do is you've got your running configuration stored in your RAM, obviously, and then you save your startup configuration to flash. That way when the device starts up, it reads it from the, the flash, which is also called NVRAM or non-volatile RAM. And you know, the more that I'm talking here about the those terms, the more I'm realizing I learned the distinctions between those in school, but in practice at my job, uh, we just say it's stored on the flash. We don't worry about the you know NVRAM or whatever. So I'm gonna go with practice. Um, so that is this device, so that's cool. Now I'm gonna take this off the table for a second. Man, this thing is huge and heavy. And here's the device that, like I said, I am more excited about. And this thing is quite a bit lighter and smaller, but it is newer. And this thing is actually not end of life yet. That other device I just got done showing you, Cisco actually doesn't even support that other one anymore. This one, Cisco has stopped selling. It is end of sale, but this one is not end of life. They have not stopped supporting it yet. So I've just zoomed in the camera a little bit more because this thing is smaller, so we have a little more space to work with. And this thing is not a rack mount piece of equipment, thankfully. This is actually a, you know, a shelf piece of equipment. You can set it on top of a rack mounted device, or you can just set it on a shelf or, you know, wherever. I'm not sure how loud this one's gonna be, probably still fairly loud, but this is what the back of it looks like. And in this case, everything, all the ports are on the same side of the device. So if I stand up again here to look around, we do have our power supply here with a switch to turn it on and off. This is a 1921 device specifically, by the way. Some kind of power over ethernet connector right there, it looks like, uh, not sure what that is. This is a Kensington lock port. Uh, which it makes sense. You're not going to be Kensington locking every single device in a rack, but if this is just sitting on a shelf, this thing was definitely expensive when it was first purchased, so you would want to lock it down so somebody can't just walk out with it. This one only has one USB port, which is perfectly fine, of course. You're not going to use that thing very often anyway, and when you do, you really only need one slot. This device, because it is newer, you can see here it says GE00 and GE01. So like I said, that is gigabit Ethernet. Uh, 10 times faster than the other one. Here's our aux connector and our console connector there. 
Uh, this device actually, even though it only has one USB type A port, I am seeing now actually a mini USB port right there. Not micro USB, but mini USB like you see on digital cameras. So that's interesting that that is there. And finally, this one also has, this only has two HWIC slots, unlike the four expansion slots in the other one. In fact, you can see it says EHWIC here, which I think is enhanced or extended HWIC. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but just a newer name for it. Same type of huge screws on these. And this one also does have a T1 connector there. So if you're in an enterprise environment, maybe you use that to connect to your ISP. Of course, if you're just at home, you're going to plug your ISP's modem into one of these gigabit ethernet ports, and you're gonna plug your switch into the other one. Looking at the camera, there we go, there's where the ports are. Sitting down here, because my back was starting to hurt from standing up and bending over the table looking at this thing. Uh, if we look at the sides of it, we do still have fan grills, which once I said I'm expecting them to be fairly loud when we turn them on. You definitely don't want this thing sitting right next to a microphone if you're recording a video or anything like that. Uh, but then here's the quote-unquote front of this device, which looks much sleeker than the other one, you know, darker color scheme. Uh, not sure if you can see that sort of, it's not a honeycomb design they've got in there, but it's it's something similar uh, with those angled lines. And really not a lot on this side, just some lights. Because this one, obviously, the, the rack mount, you're, you're going to want to access both sides of your rack. So you got some stuff plugged in one side, some stuff plugged in the other. And you can actually spin the mounts on that other one around to mount it either direction within a rack. Uh, based on your preference of which ports you need to access more often, but this one you're going to set it on a shelf Everything's going to be plugged in back here your power your ethernet everything And then the front of it is just going to have a couple lights You can see right here on the bottom of it We have a system indicator light which I assume would blink based on you know if there are errors or whatever going on with booting uh, we have a an activity light, which is going to be probably blinking for link activity or something like that. And then we have a power over Ethernet indicator to indicate if we're giving out power over Ethernet, I guess. Like I said, never, never seen one of these in person of this model. Actually, I may have seen one in a classroom, but the ones I SSH into at work are, you know, miles and miles and miles away from me. So I don't get to interact with them physically on a daily basis. Uh, we do have a sticker on the bottom of this one with our regulatory information as well for many different countries. And this one does have feet on the bottom, once again, confirming that this is a, a shelf unit. Although there are also screw holes here that you can use to hang this thing on a wall if you want to. And I have seen setups like that in the past with equipment of the this size. So yeah, that is the devices themselves. All right, so at this point, I'm loading them both back onto the desk here. Sorry, I'm, you know, my audio setup here. I'm actually going to be getting a new microphone being sent to me from a company that is uh, head-worn soon. So for videos like this, I won't have to have one sitting on the desk. But my lapel mic would have been getting in the way here, bending over this stuff. So putting the devices back on the table, though, and as long as you can hear me over all that noise, then we can go ahead and get started with taking a look at what's actually on these things. I've got my laptop here, my servo workstation from System76, and we are going to break open these accessories, and we'll see if they work with Linux. I will fire up my screen recording software. Oh, by the way, uh, this smaller device says on the top of it, it's got a sort of imprinted there Cisco inset into the metal. Uh, which is pretty neat and once again they wouldn't have done that on a rack mount device because they never would have seen it But since this goes on a shelf, they just threw it in there. So yeah, uh, let's go ahead and We'll open up this one first and I know this is gonna work because this is a super simple just wiring thing This is an RJ45 to DB9 connector an RJ45 male to DB9 female uh, which are both serial Connectors, so it's not actually doing anything with the signal. It's just passing it over wires and the wires are just sort of set up differently on both sides. They're just ordered differently. But we'll just take this cable out of the bag, take the twisty tie off of it. This is the standard color for console cables if you're wondering, at least from what I've seen. So this small end is what goes into the router and then this larger end is what we're gonna plug into either your computer if your computer actually has a DB9 port or in our case, we'll plug it into our adapter. So what I want to do in this video is see what version of iOS are on these, and if it's older than the newest version available for them, 
Uh, the iOS versions are actually available for download for free from Cisco if you have a website account with them, which I do. I've actually got two accounts. I've got one personal account that I made for my Cisco certifications that I can also use to access their downloads. I also have my work account, which I will not be logging into here, but the downloads for the OS are handled separately from the licensing. Licensing comes from a special file that will go on them, and basically I'm stuck with whatever licensing is on these already. I, I, I can't upgrade licensing. They don't even list prices for that. You know, you have to have a Cisco account representative to purchase licensing. But the license tells the OS what features you can use. And iOS is proprietary, if you're wondering. I have been looking into freedom respecting and open source networking equipment um, and networking operating systems. You know, Linux can do a lot of the things that iOS does. And in many cases, it does it just as well, honestly. Having a proprietary OS just to run a piece of networking equipment is becoming very very antiquated very quickly but as of right now as of 2019 the majority of yeah I would I would go so far as to say the majority market share for networking equipment on the internet is Cisco I would go out on a limb and say that so um, the license file tells the OS what features are available and it reads that at boot I believe so we can't touch the licensing but if there is an updated iOS version available we're gonna upgrade these to the maximum version assuming they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're like RAM requirements and things for certain iOS versions. We don't want to slow them down too much. But one of the larger projects I've been involved in at my day job actually was upgrading iOS on a large number of Cisco routers and switches. So I am very familiar with that process. Uh, so here's what the end of the console cable looks like. Very well made here, uh, just the StarTech one. And we are going to plug that into, we'll start with the older device. Once again, we'll save the best for last. Plug that in right there. Didn't go in super easy, uh, but it went in all right. I am gonna go ahead and plug in. I've got a power cable over here. This is just your standard three prong US, just like uh, your desktop computer would use for its power supply. So we'll plug that in and it turned on. I'm gonna turn it off because as you heard right there, it was very loud um, and I'm not ready yet for it. And in case you're wondering, to turn these things off, you really do just cut the power. There is no shutdown. The operating system does not even have a shutdown command. It's got a reload command, uh, but there is no shutdown command. It's all running in flash. So as long as you save what you want to save before you shut it down, you really do just cut power and that's how you turn them off. So here's the other thing I bought, which is the DB9 to USB connector. It will take our analog serial connector and turn it into USB digital. Um, I'm seeing on the back, this is actually, well, it says it's compatible with uh, USB 2.0 and 3.0, but it supports USB 1.1. So this is actually a USB 1.1 device, which is perfectly fine. That's how old these things are. And I did just have to run to the other room and grab a scissors and slice this thing. I don't have my normal knife with me here, um, but we'll pop this box open. Got the tab open now. All right, just tearing the box for this thing up. Hope I don't have to return it. As long as it works, I won't. So we just got a tray that came in the box. And there's some papers underneath it here. Looks like we've got a, a CD drive, which I can guarantee you the drivers on this thing are not for Linux. Um, well, TrendNet, there's a very, very small chance there might be a Linux driver, but I don't want to get to that point. You know, I want it to just be supported in the kernel. We've got a warning here. Um, so this product can expose you to chemicals, including lead, which is known to the state of California to cause cancer and BPA. Thank you, California, for the warnings. Excellent state, California. And here we've got our safety note uh, with a bunch of other languages of stuff inside of there. So also gonna set that off to the side. Here is a quick installation guide. I, if it's anything more than plug and play, I'm gonna be disappointed. Step one is install driver. Step two and three are plugging it in. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna try this. I'll actually need to see what program I need to install on Linux because normally I use PuTTY on Windows, but of course I don't have PuTTY installed on Linux because normally when I SSH to stuff, Linux just has SSH. Um, okay, so we've got USB here. I'm going to plug that into my System76 servo workstation on the other side. And then reaching the cord over here, I am just going to plug in our DB9 connector and screw it in. And then we'll start the screen recording, which is gonna be the more interesting part of the rest of the video for you guys. Okay, so we've got that all set up. Console cable is hanging out there. Uh, just put it down there. And 
I have just moved my microphone a lot closer to me, so might have to adjust the audio level, but I think this will be easier to hear me once I do start the routers up as well. Simple Screen Recorder is now running. So here's Audacity, which I'm using to record my audio, and there's Simple Screen Recorder I'm using for video. And I'm gonna make a quick start page search. Linux connect to console port. I have never done this on Linux before. Um, you know, the school that I went to, the college I went to was using Windows on their computers. My work uses Windows and Mac OS on their computers, but we don't really console ourselves into devices at work. All right, Nixcraft usually has some good stuff for me. All right, do we have CU installed? CU, command not found. Can we install it? No. Screen, i fairly certain we have. Nope. But we can get that, right? Yes. This is a GNU tool, I use this often on servers. Okay, so we're gonna do dmessage, egrep, dash dash color, we don't really need that, but serial, pipe, tty,s. All right, so here's our USB serial port, it is detected. Cool, and we've only got one. Uh, maybe this will be simple for us. So I'm going to run screen, dev, tty,s, um, Zero, we'll try. Screen is terminating, okay. What do we have in dev TTYS? Oh, TTY USB zero is what we want, all right. Dev TTY USB zero. Screen is terminating, okay. Okay, there we go. I ran it with sudo and it worked. So I guess because the dev TTY device is owned by root, it, was, uh, it wasn't working because I was trying to access it from my standard user account. So I'm sure there are ways we could fix that. For now, it's just my laptop, so we'll leave it using root. And here we are in with a console connection. Now, if I hit enter, we're not gonna see anything because we're obviously, the device is turned off, we're not connected. So at this point, I'm gonna flip the switch. And here is Cisco iOS starting up. You can hear that loud router. I'm gonna push that a little bit away from the microphone. Hopefully that helps. And you can see we are uh, reading, uh, and we're in Raman. Okay, tell me that we don't have iOS. Tell me that. Uh, compact flash not present. Okay, I was a little afraid of that. So it appears since we don't have a flash, how much can you guys hear me right now? Is this, okay, so you, could, you should still be able to hear me over the noise. So Cisco iOS devices, they've got something called ROMMON, which is the ROM on this device. Uh, it can be upgraded, so it's not actually ROM, but it's like the BIOS, it starts up the machine. It's stored on an internal chip inside of here, probably on a logic board somewhere, whereas iOS is stored on flash memory, like I said before. So if this thing doesn't have flash, which it says compact flash not present, then of course uh, we're not gonna have iOS if we don't even have a drive. That's like that's like trying to find an operating system on your computer if you don't have any hard drives or SSDs in it. You know, your BIOS isn't gonna have anywhere to boot. Let's do a DIR, DIR all. Uh, we can't do DIR all in Raman. Command DIR not found, all right, well. Cannot open device flash. DIR boot flash worked, so maybe we do have something. Cannot access device. Okay, so I think boot flash is what uh, is what that slot actually corresponds to, and of course it can't access it because there's not flash in there. Uh, I think our, our console is frozen here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that thing off. Now that doesn't mean this router is trash. Uh, we can get a USB drive just you know, super cheap USB drive and plug it in and boot off of the USB because it's going to extract iOS into RAM, I believe. At least the parts it's using, it's going to extract into RAM. Um, so the USB would not be a, a bottleneck on performance as far as I know. How do I exit out of screen here? There we go. Oh, I just detached, crap. That's fine. So yeah, that one does not have flash, so it doesn't have iOS. We can go and get iOS. Um, I don't have a flash drive with me here. I actually didn't see that coming. I didn't look close enough to see that the flash slot was missing, actually. 
uh, before I came over to this building earlier today, which is obviously not my normal studio. I'm at Northwest Electric Company right now, which is a company that lets me use their office in exchange for providing some IT services for them, which is a great setup. This is just one of those videos where I would not have been able to have enough room to show this stuff off properly in my bedroom. But of course the drawback is that this isn't where I normally am and so I don't have a flash drive just laying around here. Uh, let's check the other device. Let's check out our 1900 series. We'll plug in the console port here. plug-in power and this one this one does not have a slot on the outside for flash so hopefully that means that they didn't have anything they could remove and this thing's about to boot up for us so we'll turn that on much quieter to start oh that is so much quieter and it is on I can see it the lights are on however are we gonna get any output you know what I'm actually gonna turn that right back off because uh, I think I'm using screen wrong screen screen dash LS no sockets found, okay. Screen dash R, no screen to be resumed. Screen dev TTY USB zero, and we need to run that as root, of course. Okay, so we're in the console. Let me verify I'm plugged into the right port here. That says console. Oh, and by the way, earlier, um, I talked about this micro USB, or the mini USB, sorry, the mini USB port. That's actually a USB console port. Um, the full size USB is for loading files on, but the, the mini USB on this device, that's a USB console port for connecting directly to it from a laptop or something, because they know if you're purchasing this size of equipment, you may not have your setup designed for analog console ports. That's more common on newer devices. That, that's another example of this device is newer than the larger one. So we're definitely in the, the console port. Um, all right, maybe it was just taking a minute. I'm gonna turn it on again. And it does, it takes longer to even start at all. Once the fans do come on, they are uh, much less loud than the other one because if this is on a shelf, once again, in a small office, you're not gonna want it that loud. Whereas in a rack, it really doesn't matter. So we'll see if we get any output here. There we go, okay. Read-only ROM mod initiated. Or initialed. I don't know what that says. All right, so the moment of truth, are we going to boot into iOS? I see the uh, system light is blinking green. The activity light on this other side, um, it is solid green. iOS image load. Here we go, we are de uh, decompressing an iOS image. I'll grab my phone and I'll, I'll record a few quick seconds. I don't wanna turn the whole thing around just to capture lights blinking, but that is uh, what we're doing on this side here of the device. Looks like system stopped blinking when we were in iOS. That was, uh, I guess, signaling we were in ROM mod. But we are starting up iOS now. I, it do normally doesn't look like this from my experience um, booting up. I don't know if that has to do with my console converter. Or I, I have not consoled into this model of device before, so maybe that's normal. Um, is this in another language? No. It's, it's listing off its specs. Um, that might just have to do with how I've got, you know, if I can set up the software on my system to handle console connections better than just right now. It's, I guess, reading in just raw data and parsing it however screen parses it by default. So you can see it is uh, fairly slow to boot and that's fairly normal for these devices, especially the routers. The switches are a little bit quicker to come up. Routers usually do take a minute or two. Oh, this is asking me, do you want to enter the initial configuration dialog? I'm gonna hit in for no. What's it asking me now? I can't tell what it was asking me there. I, I thought it was asking me, do you want to enter the initial configuration dialog? But then it asked me something else. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, we are in iOS. Um, our serial connector is performing terribly. And I don't know, I'm gonna go ahead and put the second camera down here. This is supposed to be giving me a new line every time I hit enter but it's only giving me a new line every five or six times I hit enter. Okay, so can, yeah. It's, it's, it's sorta working, sorta. Don't know if I can, you know, unplug the console here and... Don't know if there's something stuck in there or if it's, it might just be my system. We'll try going in here again. No, 
we've only got one line. It's interesting that I didn't really notice it being all that messed up with the older device. It was just the 1900 that uh, was doing that. But yeah, um, if I can get into it with a USB console cable, it might still be a perfectly good router. Um, I am going to just plug this right back into the older router one more time. And I'm going to turn the old one on again just to validate that my console cable didn't break after I unplugged it the first time or something. That is so loud. We'll see if we get console output from this. We did before, so it should still be working. Not getting anything in putty now, which is interesting. Maybe I didn't wait long enough. Let's try it and get a new screen again. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay, that's actually great. So the other one's not working now. Which means it wasn't the device, it was I'm sitting here troubleshooting console connections and it's my console connection. I just unplugged the USB and GNU screen exited. Let me try plugging into another USB port to start with. Uh, that's great to know that it wasn't my device. Um, it, it was it was me, and that's okay. That works a lot better. Let's plug this into the newer. router again whoo here I was like freaking out you guys have been sitting here with me I'll probably edit most of that out but I thought I had a busted router and it was actually my console connection so Linux drivers folks they are still iffy on old devices like console converters and adapters here we go now look how beautiful that looks all right our our, our newer router um, is working great you can see the older router was on uh, version 12.4 um, and I don't know if that's a Raman version because I thought the older one didn't have iOS, but the newer one is on 15.0. All right. Well, that, yeah, that is the Raman version because we're still in Raman now. Um, yeah, here I was. I, I really thought I had a busted device there, which would have been a shame, but no, this thing, this is working perfectly fine. I just fell for the oldest trick in the IT book and assuming that it's the network equipment that is malfunctioning when in fact it was some other piece of equipment that is not networking related. All right, so it looks like we have iOS version 15.1, 4, 15.1.4, M3, and uh, cool, here we go. Yeah, I've seen this many times. That is what it looks like when an iOS device boots up. I am so happy that that is working. And this thing is so quiet. Like, I, I can hear that there are fans moving, but that's quieter than my desktop computer at home. In fact, yeah, this thing is way quieter than my laptop here, um, and it's a real beefy laptop, but yeah, this is this is very definitely designed to, to not make as much noise as a rack mount device. So it looks like we do have, yep, you can see two gigabit Ethernet interfaces, 255 kilobytes of non-volatile configuration memory. Looks like it, it's got some, so this is its flash internal, I guess. It, it calls it USB flash zero. Uh, would you like to enter the initial configuration dialog? No. Uh, would you like to terminate auto install? All right, so this I, I is not on every model. Normally when I say no, it, uh, it just exits. But would you like to terminate auto install? Yes, I would. Boy, I've been sitting here for quite a long time uh, troubleshooting that on the iOS side when it was just my, my console adapter. So you can see things starting up here. Um, it says interface gigabit ethernet 00 and 01 change state to down because they're not configured right now. USB flash zero has been inserted, it says. Um, serial 000 is the T1, I guess. And that is currently change state to down. Administratively down, they're all administratively down by default, which means they're set to be down. So I can hit enter a couple times, and this is this is what iOS looks like. iOS is a very easy to use operating system. Uh, basically, watch this. I can I can question mark, and I get available commands. I mean, you you don't get that on Bash, that's for sure. It's got a really simple pager. It's like more. Um, not as advanced as less on Linux, but it's it's pretty much just like more, maybe a little simpler. Um, every now and then it will page out, unless you, you can turn paging off with terminal length zero will turn paging off. But we can enable, um, there's no password by default, we can config T, and all, all these commands you'll see here, uh, iOS, you can abbreviate commands as well. So it, I just typed 
en for enable if i type tab it auto completes it out to the full enable and at this point we're not looking at the router anymore so i'm just going to move the camera in on me and i can do some kind of split screen thing in post production because now now we can have fun and look around this thing a little bit all right so if we go into configure terminal or config t as it's often shorthanded to, we can configure our router. The first thing I usually do is set the name, host name. I don't know what to call this thing, I just realized. We'll call it uh, 1921, cause, well, that's a bad host name. Cisco 1921. Uh, that's a good host name, all right. So now you can see our prompt on the left has changed to reflect the new host name, and you know it's always good to set that early on so that when you're configuring multiple devices simultaneously, you can keep track of what device you're actually on at any given point by looking at your prompt. If we exit out of here, we can do a show. Oh, uh, actually, let's let's fix that first. You see, I was in the middle of typing and then it popped up another line underneath. Since we're on a console connection, that doesn't happen on SSH, but on a console connection, it can kind of interrupt your typing. Uh, we can do line console zero is what we're connected to right now. And we can run log logging synchronous to make it so that when we exit out of here and now if I start typing, you can see it kept what I was typing. It brought it down underneath the new line that the console connection popped in there. So now we can do a show interface gigabit ethernet zero zero. And we can see the specs on that thing. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna set terminal length zero, which only saves for the current connection to the router. But you know, on Linux, I'm used to not having a pager unless I specify a pager, so. Show interface, gigabit ethernet, zero, zero. And we can see it is administratively down uh, because it's set right now explicitly to be shut down. We could plug something in and it would not come up. Um, line protocol is down. So this is your high level up down. This is your low level up down basically. We've got our MAC address right here. We can see how much bandwidth it's supposed to have, a gigabit. Uh, because it is a gigabit port. You do have statistics for input and output errors, which are always good to keep an eye on. Usually output errors indicate an issue with your device's hardware and input errors usually indicate an issue with whatever's on the other side of the connection because it's sending you junk. But we can do a show interface gigabit ethernet zero one to take a look at the other gigabit port. And you know, it's basically the same port. It's got a slightly different MAC address. Oh, here we go. Now I can hit up. Oh no, I can't. I can scroll up to go through my command history. Uh, that, that That's just my, oh, since I'm in GNU screen, it, it doesn't even keep my scroll history. All right. Yeah, that's not an iOS thing. That just has to do once again with my, my console connection set up here. But if we do a show interface, gigabit ethernet zero, zero, and we can pipe and we've got some options here. We can't do grep on this device. Some of the newer Cisco devices are actually, the newer versions of iOS are based on Linux. So you can use common Linux commands like grep, but these older iOS versions have their own syntax that's a little bit different. You can see we can include, is only going to show us lines that include the text we specify. So address is, um, and the include command is, you know, after you press space after that, it'll just do the rest of the line. So you can put spaces, you can put whatever, you don't have to put it in quotation marks. So we'll run that same command with zero one. We can see that the MAC address is literally one apart uh, from those two ports, which is neat. Uh, we can also do a show interface serial zero 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 here, and that is our serial interface. So we can see these are all administratively down. We can see that by showing our running config. Now, Cisco iOS is actually pretty neat because, well, it, it's very simple. Basically, all of your configuration is stored in one file. Imagine that, you know, on Linux, we got all kinds of configuration files. iOS, extremely simple. It's one file, and it's basically just a text file that is your entire operating system's configuration. It, it tells the router everything that it's doing, and that is in our running configuration. So I can do a show run here, and it's going to output. Now, since I'm here um, in GNU screen, I should actually probably set my terminal length to uh, the default again, which I think is 50. So I can do another show run and we can page through here. Oh, that's almost perfect, isn't it? Let me do terminal length 48, 40, 45. Let's try terminal length 45 and we'll do a show run. 
Perfect, okay, so we can see up here, uh, it's showing you your running config. It tells you when your last configuration change was, which in our case was just now. Um, the clock is actually set. It's actually set almost correct. Um, it doesn't know that we're in daylight savings time. Well, UTC wouldn't be affected by daylight savings time. So it's just an hour off, but the date is actually correct. So I'm assuming there's a working CMOS battery in this thing. The iOS version we are on is 15.1, which we will look that up in a moment to see how up to date that is. These services are default things for our logging and debugging and whatnot. You can see I set the host name just a moment ago in config T. So that shows up here in our running config. Everything you configure shows up, well, almost everything you configure shows up on your running config. The exceptions are limited, especially on a router. Here we've got some licensing information. And down here we have our interfaces. So if I hit space one more time, we've got interface gigabit ethernet zero zero. We saw before it was administratively down. You can see right here, this says shut down. We can actually go in here and no shut it and turn it on. And it won't come up because it's not plugged in right now, but we can do that and then shut down will no longer appear in here. So we'll do that in a moment. You can see right now it has no IP address because we haven't configured one. Duplex and speed are both set to auto by default. The serial port we can also set like speeds and things, but it does not have an auto. You can see we don't have the HTTP server running right now. Um, and actually, we'll plug in a network cable here. I've actually got an ethernet cable that I can plug in between the router and my laptop just to get a local connection going. You can see earlier I did config T and I said line con zero logging synchronous and that is right here. So basically what you can do is you can run copy running configuration startup configuration and I'm not sure if that would work right now. We might as well do it. Um, yeah, so this device has a flash that can store configuration. So at this point, we can turn this router off and back on, and it would still have the settings that I set, the host name, the log sync, because it would start from that startup configuration. And when it starts from startup config, I can do a show startup config. It's the exact same. It's a copy of the text file. And basically what it's going to do is go through and just run all these commands one by one. It's setting its parameters up. Um, it's going to set line con zero, which is going to autocomplete to line console zero, and it's going to run logging synchronous, and that's going to set that setting for the rest of the time that the device is powered on. It's a single configuration file that uh, is kept in sync, well, running config at least, is kept in sync with the actual state of the configuration in the RAM. So let's plug in an ethernet cable here. And this is just a cat five cable. It was just laying around here um, in the office, but we'll plug one of these into gigabit ethernet zero zero. The other one I am plugging into my laptop right now. And I'm going to go into network manager on my laptop and we're gonna create a new ethernet connection. Um, and I'm just gonna set this well, uh, these things can run DHCP servers, but I don't remember how to set that up off the top of my head. So for now, we're going to do a manual addressing. Um, so let's set the router side first, then I'll set my laptop. So we're going to config T. And actually, you can see uh, the reason Network Manager didn't try to connect with one of my other Ethernet. It actually it, it thinks Network Manager thinks it's not plugged into anything right now. It can't even see that it's plugged in because the port is shut. It's you know, it, it's not electrically sending any signals through that cable right now because it's turned off. It's administratively down. All right, so we'll go into config T and we will go into our interface gigabit ethernet zero zero. And the first thing we'll do is give it an IP address before we know shut it. We'll just IP address and I'm on a 192 network right now. I don't want to confuse my laptop here. Um, we'll do a 192 network for simplicity. We'll do 192.168.1.1. And then we have to set the subnet address next, which is 255.255.255.0. It doesn't have to be that. That's just what I'm setting it because 192 is a class C address. And normally that's used with a slash 24 subnet address. So if we hit enter now, uh, we can run regular commands while we're in config T with the do commands. I don't do this very often in practice, but since I'm making a video, I'll show you now if we do a show, a do show running config. All right, and tab completion doesn't work with uh, with do, but we'll do a show running config. I could still use shorthand and it would be OK. Uh, we'll pipe include. Actually, no, we'll do section interface gigabit ethernet zero zero we'll run that and it's just going to show us in fact i think i can do show running config interface 
Gigabit Ethernet 00. Yeah, it does the same thing. You can see now our interface Gigabit Ethernet 00 in our running config text file. It's got IP address 192.168.1.1 and then our subnet mask where it used to say no IP address. So it has updated that file. And these two commands that I said did the same thing. What I did the first time was I displayed the entire running configuration, then I filtered it using the section command, which is gonna just display one indented section of that text file. The second time I did do show run, and then I used interface, which is actually a special command to just show the configuration on that interface. So then it built the configuration of just that interface rather than building the entire thing and then filtering the output. But now we have an IP address, and at this point we can actually just type no shut or no shut down. I'll hit enter and my laptop's gonna see that connection uh, you can see change state to down because the link has not been established. Hmm. So my laptop is not giving me any options for an Ethernet network. I am just going to complete uh, the configuration here since the router is 1.1. We'll give the laptop 192.168.1.2. Uh, gateway is going to be 168.1.1, which is the router. Nothing else will matter yet because we don't have anything else configured. Uh, the router is not actually connected to the internet or anything. All right, so my laptop's still not seeing this thing as connected. And we are on, so we just configured Ethernet 00. If I do a show interface gigabit Ethernet 00, uh, it's down, line protocol is down. Just gonna plug in one more time there. So we, we do have a link light but we are down, down. This is gonna be real embarrassing if I can't get a single link working. This might not be a good ethernet cable since it's just one that I uh, grabbed from somewhere in here. here. I've got another one, it's just really long so I didn't wanna break it out, but I will just to eliminate that as a possible issue. So we'll plug in ethernet to the laptop and to the router over here. And we got a link light on the router. Here we go. Okay, it was a bad ethernet cable. So once again, I thought I was doing something wrong, uh, but this time it was the, the cable that we were using. So I just plugged that in and it says link three up down, interface gigabit ethernet zero zero change state to up and line protocol five up down, line protocol and interface gigabit zero zero change state to up. So that's saying basically the, the low level connection was made and the high level connection was made. I can go in here and specify, I want ethernet connection three on my laptop, which is the one we just set with the correct IP address. So now I can do a show interface gigabit ethernet zero zero. And that's going to show that we are up up, which is what we usually want. I can also do a show IP interface gigabit ethernet zero zero and that's going to show us IP related information for layer three we've got our IP address our broadcast address various options that we can set here I can do a show IP interface brief to show just a summary of all the ports on this thing you can see we've got our two gigabit ethernets our serial and there's one other port in here that could have an IP address that's embedded service engine zero zero not sure what that is but you can see here, Gigabit Ethernet 00, 192, 168.1.1 is up, up. So that's cool. And now on my laptop, I can open up another terminal here. And I'll put it up in the top left corner. And I can ping 192.168.1.1. And you can see I am getting a response in less than half a millisecond because it's plugged right in. From the router, I can also ping my laptop at 192.168.1.2, and you can see it very quickly sent five pings with a 100% success rate. Now that I've sent that ping, I can do a show ARP to show our ARP table, and you can see I ARPed for 192.168.1.2, and this is the hardware address of my laptop's gigabit ethernet port, which if I do an IP address on my laptop, we can see our ethernet port has that MAC address. That does match, even though uh, Linux puts a colon in between every two characters in a MAC address and iOS puts a dot in between every four characters of a MAC address, the actual characters are the same. Um, so you can see that we looked up, you know, when we pinged from the router and actually it would have had to do that to respond to the pings before anyway. Um, it looked up what MAC address, what layer two address has this layer three address. 
and put it in our ARP table there. You can do a clear IP ARP and we can type in 192.168.1.2 to clear that ARP entry from our table. It came right back very quickly, uh, but that is a useful command sometimes. When you're replacing a device, but the new device has the same IP address as the old one, sometimes on the iOS devices in some specific circumstances, you can actually end up with outdated ARP entries. So you've got a device plugged in with the correct IP address, but traffic isn't reaching it because it's trying to go to the old Mac address. You have to clear the ARP entry. So what else can we do with this thing? Let's do a, a DIR now. So our our flash is called USB flash zero. If I do a dir all, um, we've got our system. I think these are just virtual. Tempsys is definitely a virtual file system. Here's our NVRAM, uh, which I think did think we would have. You can see NVRAM is where the startup config is stored. So that's the difference between NVRAM and Flash. You can store backups of your configuration on your Flash, but NVRAM is a separate Flash device in the router that stores your startup config. Private config is probably gonna have passwords in it. Um, the other one, the config that's not in startup config is on switches. Your VLAN information is stored in a separate file, vlans.dat. Uh, but this is a router, so we won't see that. But you can see our, our USB flash. You can also do DIR on one specific file system to list anything in that file system. That has our current iOS image, which is C1900 Universal 9 MZ SPA 151-4.m3.bin. Let's check, I'm just curious, if that's the latest iOS that we can have. It was put on here in December 22nd, 2011. So there might have been updates to this thing. Um, of course, it's end of sale now, not end of life yet, but end of sale. So there might not be updates, but we could have them. So let's go to, is it cisco.com slash downloads? Nope. Is it downloads.cisco.com? Nope. I'm just going to duck, duck, go Cisco downloads. I didn't even spell it right, but here we go. We've got Cisco download website. So we are going to locate our product here. And this is something once again that I've done at work quite a bit, just making sure we're still recording because we've been going for quite a while here. We want networking software and no, see, I don't want to select by software though. So routers, and this is a 1921. So this is a, an ISR 1900 series integrated services router. We'll click on that. This is our specific router. You can see it's in my history. I looked it up on my desktop before and Firefox sunk my history. Um, so that link is purple. But I was looking up the specs of this thing when Michael told me, oh, this is actually orderable. This is not end of sale yet. Oh, the, the 19, some of the 19, probably the 1941s are still orderable. The 1921 we can see here is end of sale, but it's still supported. If we click on the announcement, the end of life is not until 2023. All right, but we're looking for iOS. So if we go to downloads here, iOS software, latest release is 15.8.3. Uh, let's go to all releases just to see what we got. Okay, so latest release is 15.8.3. Um, the recommended release, latest recommended is 15.7.3. We're currently running, what are we running? We're running 15.1.4, which is way back here. Yeah, 15.1.4 M3. This is the image that we are running right now. Um, I can actually, we can compare that with a checksum to verify, but this is, you can see they downloaded it on the 9th of December, 2011, or they released it on the 9th and then they uploaded it here on December 22nd. So they up, they updated the router uh, the same month it came out. Of course, that might've been what it shipped with on the other hand, cause that's pretty early on in the history here. If I do a verify slash MD5 on the C1900, dash oh i uh, need to specify my file system usb flash zero colon slash c1900 now i can tap complete uh, so now we can do an md5 checksum uh just to prove that we could actually re-download that exact file that's sitting on this thing from this company but then we will upgrade to a newer version which will be exciting all right so that md5 that did not take very long uh that starts with 9396 and ends in df and if we look at our MD5 on the website, 9396 ends in DF. So that is the same MD5 checksum right there. That is cool. Um, so this is definitely the correct page on the Cisco website too to download the new stuff. So Cisco, these, these stars are for the Cisco suggested releases, uh, which are supposed to be, you know, stable and whatnot. 
Um, so the most recent suggested release was released on April 2nd, 2019, and the most recent release total was released on April 4th, two days later of this year. Uh, they are still releasing updates for this. That is very cool. Here's where we get our, uh, our, our little dilemma. Do I go with the, the recommended release or do I go with the latest release? And I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we might want to look up if we were using this, you know, in an enterprise environment, we would look up the RAM requirements and the, the CPU requirements for this specific 1900, 1921 uh, model and compare it to the requirements for these specific versions of iOS. But in my case, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just playing around with it right now. It's not in production yet. Um, what's the difference between an MD and an ED release? How to choose a Cisco iOS software release. I need this right now. All right, so MD stands for maintenance deployment, which would be like a, a patch release. ED is early deployment. These releases provide both new features and new platform support in addition to bug fixes. MD is maintenance deployment, used to provide additional support for bug fixes and ongoing software maintenance. So it really does just mean the MD is a patch release. ED is like a, a feature release that has not been extensively tested yet. You know what, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna download the latest recommended release. I can always go and upgrade it again later. Um, so we will download this. Oh, can I download it? I, it might not let me without a, a Cisco login actually, now that I think about it. Whew, oh no, in order to continue, okay, no, yeah, I, I totally can uh, download it. I just need to add an address to my Cisco account. And this is once again, my, my personal, well, it's my nerd on the street, Cisco account, which is what my certifications are stored under. Nerd on the street obviously is not large enough to have a Cisco support contract. You can see I have something my company in my profile. Oh, add new address, that's what it wants. Okay, I have just done that. Let's see if it lets us uh, download this right away. We'll refresh, download. So some of these, they used to have a bunch of different iOS files based on the features that were included but like i said nowadays they just ship one universal file and then your license file tells ios what features to enable or disable because they had issues back in the day when they were split up between different files based on what feature set you've purchased people could just purchase one feature set and then share it with other people by copying the ios file it's a little bit harder to share license files and easier to track back down to the person who started it the one exception to the the no split rule is the payload encryption and that's a matter of export laws some countries cisco can't ship products that can do strong encryption into so they've got the no payload encryption version which we don't want obviously but we'll try downloading uh to download the software oh you must have a valid service contract all right all right, guys, I did just make a couple phone calls and I managed to legally acquire a few Cisco iOS images. The fact that it is so hard to get a hold of those images is really quite sad. And that is, you know, why I'm interested in looking at other vendors and at freedom respecting and open source solutions for networking because, you know, this stuff is sitting at the core of, of our society. I don't think that it should be that locked down. I think anyone should be able to look at the code and also acquire and use the code when they need it. So maybe one day I'll do a video about, you know, building a Linux router or something like that. But for now, we've got iOS images right here. And we are going to go ahead and upgrade the iOS on this 1900 series. Now, I was not able to get any images for the 2811 router because it is end of support. They don't even host iOS images for it anymore. So that one might be difficult. And I'll have to talk to Michael and see. He got a bunch of these routers at once from our friend. But we'll have to see if any of those other routers contain an iOS image that we can copy off. Or if these devices are just junk now and will sit in a landfill because Cisco is no longer hosting the code for them. Or maybe I'll be able to find those online somewhere else since they're quite a bit older. For now though, we'll go back into our screen session. You can see it timed me out. Uh, by default, there is a timeout on the console. I can go into config T and line con zero. And what's the command to, you can see iOS really holds your hand. Uh, Cause if you don't know something, just question mark. The command to turn off the timeout is exec dash timeout right here. So we'll do exec dash timeout. And then you can do a question mark and it tells you the possible options. Uh, timeout in minutes zero is gonna turn that right off. So now I have turned off the console timeout. All right, so at this point, once again, I can do a dir. I don't remember the name. Uh, so USB flash zero. Okay, and I can also do a show version. 
and show version is going to show us once again what we're currently running as well as some other info. I'm looking for specs here. If we go back to the, the Cisco download page that was not letting me download, um, downloads, all releases. There was actually some just basic requirements right here. Yeah, your DRAM, DRAM requirement and flash requirement. I think we should be good on those. DRAM requirement is 512. DRAM configuration is 64 bits wide with parity disabled. I, I'm, I don't know how to read that. Um, if we go to 15.1.4 is what we're running right now. DRAM was 256 back then, which is still more than 64. So let's try booting the new iOS. And if it doesn't turn on, then we'll go back to the old iOS. I know how to set it up so it'll fail over. Um, or if worse comes to worse, we can boot into Ramon using that reset button for 30 seconds. So what we're going to do is transfer this image that I've got on my laptop to this iOS device and we'll see what protocols we have available. In the past, I've used SCP, which is a, just a terrible, terrible file transfer protocol. It is very slow. The, the protocol itself is slow, but I can config T and it's going to be under IP. And what can we do here? FTP is an option, so I think we'll do FTP. If we can't do SFTP, um, which I we don't have certificates set up or anything, which I'll do eventually to get SSH working, but that's not what this video is about. Um, so we can either do, yeah, SCP is an option or FTP is an option. Let's do FTP. Um, so IP, FTP, server, no. Oh. IP FTP. Okay. So with SCP configuration, you do IP SCP server enable, um, and then you, you connect. Now we don't actually have a user account in our running config right now. So I'm not sure how we'd be able to authenticate. Um, but it looks like IP FTP, we can do username, iOS, password. Uh, no, we just set IP FTP username, iOS, IP FTP password, in a new command, we'll do upgrade. And that should be everything we need right now because the other two have to do with, maybe this device or this iOS version can't do an FTP server. All right, if we go back into global config here, we have a command called FTP. No, we don't, all right. Yeah, let's, let's try SCP, I guess. IP SCP server enable. Uh, and we'll add a user to this this device as well. Username, iOS, yeah, password, upgrade. I don't know why I'm trying to autocomplete a password. It's getting a little late here, 3 a.m., still chugging along. Privilege is our, oh, is that the last? Username, iOS, privilege. 15 is going to give us full privileges when we log in with this account. I'll change it later, obviously. Uh, password, upgrade, that should be everything we need. And actually, if we used secret, it would encrypt it in the running configuration so it's not just stored in plain text in that text file, it, where it hashes it, it doesn't really encrypt it. It salts and hashes it if you use secret. Password is just literally going to store this exact line in our file, which is fine because that's not a sensitive password. I'm showing it to you on video anyway. So now we can exit, we can do show run, include SCP, and we've got our line here, IP SCP server enable. So let's see if my computer, can Dolphin do SCP? Let's open up a new Dolphin window here and let's try connecting to SCP colon slash slash 192.168.1.1. Invalid protocol, all right. Okay, well, OpenSSH does contain an SCP utility. So if I go to a command prompt on, or a terminal on my system, uh, if I run SCP, yeah, so we've got an SCP command. So I'll CD into documents, Cisco iOS. Um, so we are going to transfer on the latest, no, the recommended, which is 157-3. So we're going to SCP. Our source is C1900 Universal 9 MZ SPA 157. And our destination is going to be iOS, which is our username at 192.168.1.1, the address of the router, colon, to say this is what we want the file to be called, slash for the root of our file system, and C1900, I'm gonna actually copy the file name because I want it to be called the exact same thing, 
when we get it onto the router. So copy and paste. So we will run that. Connection refused on port 22. Maybe we need SSH set up before we can use SCP because SCP is secure copy protocol, so it would use encryption. All right, well, let's get SSH working then. We'll go into config T and crypto key generate RSA. Oh, I keep scrolling here on my laptop. General keys, modulus 4096 is fine. Um, that's all the options that we need. Nope, provide a domain name first. Uh, so we will do IP domain dash name. And for now, I'm going to call the IP domain name, I'm going to call it knots.local because, you know, this is an internal router here. So now we can run generator crypto key. It's going to take a minute because we chose the largest and most secure key possible, which I really didn't need just for this, but that's what I chose to generate. So at this point, the CPU is being taxed more than it usually would be. Um, still not hearing a lot of fan noise. This thing is pretty quiet. Okay, and that's finished. That took a couple minutes. Um, SSH has also been enabled by doing that. So it was already like enabled in the configuration, but now it's actually been enabled because we've got a certificate for it. So now we will also go into line. Before we did line console, we're going to do line VTY, which stands for virtual terminal. And we're going to type zero space four. So we're setting up five virtual console lines. They're going to be numbered zero, one, two, three, and four. The reason we're setting up more than one is so that say one connection is open and I happen to leave it open for some reason. I go to another computer and I want to SSH into the router. I can still do that because there are four more open lines. We'll type transport input and the options are all SSH, Telnet. There are some other ones. We'll do SSH might as well now because we've enabled it anyway. Okay, so now we can come back to our, our terminal on our system and we can actually SSH um, iOS at 192.168.1.1. Uh, no matching cipher found. Okay, interesting, interesting. And we'll get the same error if we try and use SCP. Yeah, and we're getting debug uh, messages on the router for that too. Oh, uh, here, config T IP SSH version 2 right yeah because we were on we were well we were on 1.99 before uh let's see if that makes a difference if we try an ssh nope still no matching cipher found okay all right well that's nano into etsy ssh ssh underscore config and uh let's do that as a root user here on my laptop and we will enable one of these weaker ciphers um so what, what were we being offered? Let's copy these. Their offer, um, we just need to enable one of these on our local system. They are disabled by default. I'm using Bash as a notepad right now. Uh, they're disabled by default for security because they're kind of old and weak. And maybe this new iOS version will support some better ciphers. Oh, interesting. There's actually a line with uh, exactly the ciphers we need. So let's try enabling that line and... Try SSHing again. Here we go. Uh, so now it's letting us. We can type in our password, which is upgrade. And now we have connected to our router. Oh, upgrade. Did I mistype? Uh, what was our password again? Show run include username. Our password was upgrade. U P G R A D E. Hmm. All right. Uh, if we config T and we go back into our our line VTY zero through four, uh, login will let us select. We're using login local. Let's try setting login local. Login local, because uh, that should query our local database, our running config for the the username and password. So password upgrade. There we go. Hey, we're in. So now we're actually SSH'd into the router and I can do all the same stuff. I can do a show run. You can see it's much faster now than it was going through the console connection. Uh, so now we can clear our screen. We can exit from iOS. We can clear our screen. And if I do an ls-al again, let's once again try SCP. Source is this file right here. 
and our destination is iOS at 192.168.1.1 colon this file. Let's run that. We'll be asked for a password. Upgrade. And now we are transferring that file to the device at a whopping 500 kilobits per second, 451. That's a gigabit ethernet link. Now we're plugged in with a cat 5e e cable. Um, so, you know, limited to less than gigabit probably, but still, I mean, 400 kilobits per second. That that's how slow SCP is. Like I said, it's a terrible protocol. Um, SFTP or FTPS, which I haven't used a lot, but SFTP is the one that I usually use for, you know, transferring files between Linux machines. And it does not have this speed limitation that SCP seems to have. Of course, since it's encrypted, maybe it has to do with the uh, the decryption speed on the router, since I know the, the processor is designed for routing and, you know, and switches also designed for switching, but not designed for much else. So the activity light right now is blinking very quickly. I can take another auxiliary video here and you can see it is uh, it's going and there's activity happening because we're copying this file about 32% of the way through. Some of these took hours at my work when we were transferring these things. Of course, we were going like all the way across the country with them, but the speed was about the same because it's already phenomenally slow, but they were, they were larger files too on much more complicated devices, larger rack mount devices. Like if we were doing this on, on this device, it would probably be even slower than this because the file would be bigger too because the device can, I guess, do more. All right, and that has finished transferring. You can see the activity light has also finished blinking. And my camera has run out of battery, so I'm gonna plug in a webcam real quick. All right, and I am recording my video now as well. Again, uh, not at the location where my stuff actually is, so I don't have a spare battery or a battery charger. But the iOS file is finished transferring. Now if we do a DIR on the router, you can see we have two files, one, uh, modified December 22nd, 2011, the old version, and the new version right here, which is modified May 10th, 2019. So how we upgrade these, it's actually very simple. It's not rock and science at all. Um, it's risky because things can break when you do this, but you know, it's just like patching or any other sort of upgrades that you do or updates to your software. If we do a show run right now, uh, and we do an include boot, we're going to get nothing. If we do a show boot var, what do we get? Show, uh, what, what, what is it? Environment? No, I was right the first time. It's supposed to be show boot var, but this device doesn't have that. So if we do a show run include boot, uh, right now we don't have any boot files specified. We don't even have the old file specified. I guess Ramman just saw it was the only bootable file on the device and it booted to that. So if we do a config T, and we run boot, okay, system, flash, except we are booting from USB flash zero. Yes, boot system flash, USB flash zero, and then the name of the file, which is going to be, I'm going to add in two entries here. The first entry is going to be our new file which um, we want the full path. So we're actually gonna type in again, USB flash zero colon. And I, my instinct is to put a slash here before this file name, but we won't because sometimes it messes it up if you do that. So we'll paste in the file name there. I know it just scrolled our, our output here. We'll hit enter and it took that. Now we're gonna put another one in, uh, boot system flash USB flash Oh, I'm sorry, boot system. I'm so, I'm muscle memoried in uh, from, from doing this at work. So boot system, USB flash zero, because it's different on my device and I can't scroll. Did I, did I break my console connection again? What, what's, what's going on? DIR config T boot system flash, no, boot system USB flash zero. And we're going to paste in also the old file name, USB flash zero colon paste. Okay. Enter. So now if we do a show run include boot, we've got boot system, USB flash zero and the new file name, and then boot system, USB flash zero, the old file name. If for whatever reason we cannot boot into the new file name, if it's corrupted or anything like that. And by the way, uh, verify 
slash md5. We'll make sure that our, our SCP copy worked. So we'll copy this entire file name to demonstrate this is a valid you know, file name here. And it's calculating an md5 for that. If it can't boot from the first one, it goes just down the list. That's how it works. So this file is uh, maybe quite a bit bigger than the old one you, we can see here. This is what I was expecting it to do earlier. I was surprised when it didn't take as long. Okay, so here's our MD5 checksum. Starts with 02F7, ends in 99. I'm just gonna go back to the Cisco website again and check. Uh, we're doing the latest suggested release. And the checksum for that is, starts with 02F7, ends in 99. Cool, so we are good. So at this point, we are going to copy, run, start. And by the way, there's another command called write mem or write memory. Um, that's an older command. Copy, run, start is newer than write memory. Um, and you don't actually, there's no real difference between the two. Write memory is kind of just a, a sim link to copy, run, start at this point. But we have just copied our running configuration with those new boot pointers to our startup configuration. So I'm gonna do one more, show version here. And we will see we were running version 15.14 M3, okay? So now we are going to, our config register is uh, 2102, which we want as well. We are going to reload this device. Proceed with reload, yes. And with any luck, we will come back up into the new version. Now in this case, it's not actually that risky. You know, it's either gonna boot or it's not. If I did something wrong with the, the configuration, then it'll go into ROM mod mode if it can't boot, and then we can manually select the old file to boot to. When you've got a very complex configuration on your iOS device, the some of the software issues that you run into are um, syntax changes over time that iOS has put in. You know, if the syntax for a certain command is one thing in one version and it's different in another version, usually iOS is smart enough to automatically strip out the, the old syntax from your running configuration, but it doesn't always put the newer syntax in there. So sometimes configuration that you had before the, the upgrade is just gone. You don't have that setting in the new upgrade. So you have to really make sure that everything that your router is configured to do, it's still doing and it's still configured to do after you do the upgrade. Um, you just want to scan through your running config. Basically, you want to take a full running config before you upgrade, a full one after, and run them through a diff program, basically, uh, to see what's changed and verify that changes that have been made are, uh, are okay, and correct anything that you did not want to change. So at this point, we are loading. Did we see what iOS version we're loading? I didn't see. I saw ROM mod, and now we're just loading iOS. I guess we'll see when it's done decompressing. Did we get the new version? The other risky thing is the hardware side of it. Um, a lot of these devices, older ones, things can actually break just from reloading the device. If you know, you've got, hey, 15.73 M4A, cool. We have upgraded the iOS and we'll see how everything's working when it turns on. Um, and the real scary part is, yeah, you see our connection to ethernet just established. I'm watching this through a console connection, but when you're reloading devices on the other side of the country, you don't have a console connection. You hit reload, you get disconnected from your SSH session because the thing's rebooting, and then you don't know if it's gonna come back up or not. And if it doesn't, then it's you know kind of scary and you gotta go and figure out what happened with a console connection and you know working with people on site and things. Okay, but that is finished booting. But yeah, older devices that are prone to, to things failing in them, sometimes a reload is all you need to trigger a piece of hardware burning out and then you gotta RMA it with Cisco. Um, if you have a support contract, in, in my case I don't, uh, so that's why I was freaking out about the console connection earlier was because if this thing breaks, it's just I don't have it anymore. Okay, but that is it is finished reloading, so I can hit enter, enable. Okay. I'm trying to see, let's do show CPU, show proc CPU history. There we go, okay. So it looks like we did have a spike in CPU usage about 30 seconds ago, but at this point, oh, I can't use up arrow. Uh, show proc CPU history. Another CPU usage. Oh, so it's going this direction. So yeah, our CPU usage is pretty stable at this point. And it didn't even go, I don't think it actually went above 40% uh, last time, yeah. Cool. We've got more graphs. 
Okay, we can do show proc memory to show how our our memory is doing. We've got plenty of free memory here compared to our used. So uh, yeah, it looks like the new iOS version at least fits on the thing and it did boot up. Um, so that is very neat. And now um, I, I'm gonna SSH in now because I'm tired of dealing with the, the slow console connection. SSH iOS at 192.168.1.1. And password is upgrade. Okay, so now I'm gonna do terminal length zero because this is a normal SSH session, I can scroll. Now we can do a show run. It's all gonna come out at once because I turned off paging. Uh, but now you can see our version has been upgraded um, in our running config and it's now 15.7. Host name stayed the same. I wonder if we have any more commands now. Can we do show boot var now? No, we can't. Okay, I'm gonna take out those FTP commands that we didn't use earlier, IP, FTP, username, iOS, and to, to take out a configuration, you just run no and then that item. So you literally just put no in front of it. No IP, FTP, username, iOS, no IP, FTP, password, upgrade. So I can exit, show run, and now there's no, uh, no FTP entries there. So I can copy run start again, and it's warning us that we are attempting to overwrite an in VRAM configuration previously written by a different version of the system image. So what this is saying is, hey, warning, you are saving a configuration that was generated by a different version of iOS than what was there before. But we know that that's expected because now we're on a new version of iOS. So that's awesome. Um, and that's all I'm gonna do in this video. It's freaking almost 4 a.m. on a Friday morning. And this is what I've been doing is checking out this router. I'm really excited about this. Um, like I said, I didn't have like a home lab or anything before. The 2811 is gonna be a little more difficult to work with because it doesn't have a flash card in it. And we also, I don't know if Michael has any images for the 2811 or not, but I'll look around online. I'll see what I can do in terms of that one. I know this stuff is kind of locked down and it's not exactly, if you if you don't have one sitting in front of you, not exactly the most interesting thing uh, to watch, but hopefully this was at least a little entertaining for you guys. I was really excited about it when Michael told me about this stuff. You know, this router can do all kinds of things. This can do NAT, this can do, it can do some, maybe some basic firewall stuff. Um, I think it has the ability to be a wireless access point. I'm not sure if it has all of the hardware modules it would need for that or not, if it's got an actual wireless card or not. I'll have to look into that. But yeah, I, I may end up using this as my home router at some point. Um, the other one I was hoping to use here at this company, but obviously not gonna not gonna work today. But yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions about Cisco or uh, just networking in general down in the comment section below, whether you're watching this on YouTube, DailyMotion, or nerdonthestreet.com. If this video was interesting to you, feel free to subscribe to the Nerd Club over at nerdclub.nots.co. Join the club. It's only $3 a month, and you can help support more cool videos like this. You know, maybe one day, Nerd on the Street can actually have support contracts with companies if we uh, get big enough to require them. I can also manage your Linux server remotely at managebuy.nots.co if you're looking for a remote Linux sysadmin. And finally, a big thank you to my friend Michael Cheneau for passing these two routers to me. You can tell I'm having fun with them and I appreciate it a lot. For now, with these routers, that's everything I had planned to talk about. So I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd of the Street, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.